Hello everybody, happy Thursday. Here's what's coming up tonight on News Center Now. We are in our Project Heat Studios. We're gonna tell you how you can help keep Mainers warm during the winter. It is so important. We appreciate all your help. We'll give you all the details coming up. Get those phones ringing. Plus, we're gonna have all the headlines that you're talking about today. This is News Center Now. <laughs> you know, sadness, anger, hate. Those are the words one parent is using after she says she saw photos of her 10-year-old daughter posted online without their consent. Augusta police say they are aware of a registered sex offender taking pictures of young girls and posting them on social media, but no laws have been broken. Hello everyone, I'm Lindsay Mills. Yeah, I'm Lee Goldberg. The reason police say that they can't do anything is because he's protected by the Constitution. He's taking the pictures in public places and even if it is of a young child or a young adult by a registered sex offender, many parents are outraged. They're taking matters into their own hands, writing all kinds of letters to state lawmakers. We spoke to one concerned parent and a lawmaker who are considering taking legislative action. Thousands of pictures of people, younger girls, older girls. I mean, there really wasn't any, it wasn't all minors, but... A lot of it was minors. Jessica Sproul of Walderboro had heard of these photos being posted and created a Flickr account to see with her own eyes. She started crying when she saw her 10-year-old daughter included in those photos appear to be taken during a recent trip to Barnes & Noble. We had a sad conversation last night at bedtime. She just was feeling bad about things. One business, Hannaford, has since banned the person who admits to taking the photos from entering their Augusta store. Sproul is not the only parent concerned. State Representative Matt Pouliot works for District 86, which includes areas north and west of Augusta. He says he's heard from many parents over the last 24 hours. I don't have children, but if I did, I would be shocked. And many of these parents are shocked, and rightfully so. He says there are many layers to this issue. One of the issues that you run into is people's First Amendment rights. One thing that we need to look at is where do we where would we draw the line on who can and can't do this? I mean, if I go to a baseball game at Fenway Park and I want to snap a photograph that includes the crowd of people, which also has minors in that photograph, you know, would that be illegal? Um, you know, uh, for somebody that's on the sex offender registry, maybe it would be. For somebody who wasn't, maybe it wouldn't be. Uh, those are the types of things that we would need to start looking at uh, to, to address this from happening in the future. He says he and his colleagues have started a conversation. We've started to look at what we could do in terms of crafting legislation, but the bottom line is it's um, it's not something that can be addressed quickly. Meanwhile, New Center Maine has learned students at Snow Pond Arts Academy in Sydney notified school officials of pictures taken of their peers near bus stops, and the school has redrawn the school bus route. The superintendent says she sent out a notification to parents about the route changes and reason for it Thursday. All right, so we spoke to the man who took these pictures. He says it's all a big misunderstanding. He has taken down all of the pictures that he had put up. You will get to hear from him and hear what he had to say coming up on News Center at 6 o'clock. So make sure you watch that. Yes, but a lot of you had questions about the sex offender registry in Maine and what restrictions or protections were in place. And right now we are taking your questions to Assistant District Attorney of Cumberland County, Christine Tebow. Good uh, afternoon, Christine, and thank you so much for being with us today. Yes. Um, our first question comes from Jennifer. She asks, isn't it illegal for a registered sex offender to take pictures of children? No, not necessarily. Um, there are certain crimes for which a conviction uh, prohibits a person from initiating contact with an individual under 14 years of age. But that's the tricky language, right? Initiating contact. What does that mean? consist of and arguably just taking a photograph isn't initiating contact with another person. I think we all just kind of assume that when you go to the supermarket, when you go to the, into a store, people aren't going to be taking pictures of you or your children. So as a parent, how do I protect my kids if it's not illegal to do it? What can I do if someone's taking pictures of my little kids and posting them on their social media websites? Well, you certainly as a parent have the right to limit access to your child. So if you encounter an individual who's taking pictures of your children 
and you feel that they have some nefarious motive for doing that, you can remove your child. You can notify the owner or the manager of the establishment who can then legally ask that person to leave. You can, if you, and trust your gut, if you feel like the person that's taking the photographs is really doing something harmful to children, contact the police. They'll investigate to determine whether a crime has occurred. So, Faileen wants to know, uh, she thought sex offenders can't have social media accounts. Is that accurate? Not, not as a blanket rule. Keep in mind that for each conviction, a person may have additional conditions on their liberty, conditions of probation. They may be subject to some other court order or protective order, and the police are the ones who are going to know that. They'll know by running that individual's criminal history, what limitations he or she may have on their liberty. All right, I think we have time for one more. Uh, Stacy asked, so why do schools send home forms to sign to allow the school to take pictures or video of children? Don't sex offenders need permission as well, just like that? Well, no, I, I think as in a free society, we're allowed to do many things that are deemed just not harmful to others. And so my taking a picture of a person's dog because I think they're beautiful um, or taking a picture that happens to capture children isn't in and of itself illegal. Again, you've got to look at the individual who's taking the pictures and what, is, what are they doing to distribute those pictures. Certainly if there's an ongoing course of conduct involving social media, that person can uh, make a complaint and perhaps go to the court and ask for a protection from harassment order. Again, contacting the police and asking the police to get involved will, I, I recommend that over taking matters into your own hands. All right, ADA Christine Tebow, thank you so much. We're going to make you stick around mm -hmm. for the commercial break so we can answer some questions on Facebook. So if you have questions, please send them along. Thank you very much for coming in thank and you. talking about this. All right. On to something much lighter, and that would be the weather. Slushy, <laughs> slippery roads uh, after yesterday's snowfall, but the sun was out today. Keith, did we melt anything today or not yet? Oh, uh, just probably a little bit, Lee. We're actually going to start with some of the reports. And uh, in a very unweatherman fashion, we're showing you mainly the ones that we got wrong. Most of us fell in the 4 to 7 range as predicted, but these were some of the higher ones over down East Main, 11 inches the highest report, Southwest Harbor around 7.1. So that's where it was anomalously high. Most of us were 4, 5, 6 inches of snow. Nothing on the map right now. This is all lake effect stuff as the colder air still going over some of the uh, lakes here, Lake Ontario specifically. I'm surprised it's not more frozen after a deep freeze, but there's not uh, obviously still a little moisture left there. Temperatures in the 20s right now. We're not going to be all that cold tonight. Teens for most of us, some single digits up towards Caribou, but nothing unseasonably cold. And tomorrow's a similar day. Temperatures around 30. Could see an isolated flurry uh, tomorrow afternoon, but most of the day is partly cloudy. And then we start to ridge up and warm up on Saturday and Sunday. But you guys, just like spring in Maine, not everyone will be mild. Uh, on Saturday and Sunday. It'll be a split state forecast, so we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, sir, look forward to that. So a mix-up at the pump could do some serious damage to your car. People make mistakes. It's unfortunate. Uh, I feel bad for the person that did it. A local gas station had diesel in the regular gas pumps. We'll talk to customers about their repair bills coming up. And today is the Project Heat Telethon. The Keep Me Warm Fund was created in 2008. It's a partnership between the 10 United Ways in Maine and 10 community action agencies. It's the only statewide program that provides emergency heating assistance and support to low-income households and organizations throughout Maine. So please call and donate to New Center Maine's Project Project Heat Telethon today. All the proceeds go to the fund and help keep Mainers warm. If you've ever lost power in the winter, you know how terrible it is to not have any heat. That's right. And for people going through hard times or living on a fixed income, it could be a daily curse. That's why New Center Maine is teaming up with Dead River Company and United Way for the Project Heat Telethon. Chris Coster standing by in our Project Heat studio. Chris, how can people help out? 
Haley and Lindsay, so just so everybody knows, all the money that we're raising today is going towards the Keep Me Warm Fund, and basically it's distributed to people who need heating oil assistance. Here's how you can help. You can start by calling the number at the bottom of your screen. You can see this little ticker down here, or you can go to newscentermain.com to donate. It's a really important issue, especially this time of year. We know how cold it's been over the past two weeks, and if we know anything about Maine winters, we know that cold is certainly likely to come back. There are a lot of people out there who need this help right now. We know that $300, a $300 donation, for example, can provide 100 gallons of heating oil. So that's just for a little perspective so you can understand what people may need around this time of year. But we do have a little bit of incentive for you as well. We are partnered with Dead River. Every dollar that the public donates to the Keep Me Warm Fund, the Dead River Company will match up to $75,000. So that means if you donate $100, we make it $200. We can bring it as far up to $150,000. That's more than what we raised last year. I'd like to bring in now Michael Tarpinian. He's the CEO of Opportunity Alliance. And Opportunity Alliance is one of those community action programs that we talked about that helps distribute these funds. And Michael, you were telling me a story about a woman that you guys helped just a week ago. Just a week ago, a 93-year-old woman from uh, Naples called us late one night, had run out of uh, oil, needed some help, was on fixed income, um, and we were able to, uh, through 211, were able to get her uh, fuel and get her furnace up and running again. Um, uh, two weeks ago, we got a call from a family of seven in Gorham. Um, they had run out of uh, uh, oil, and uh, the children were fully clothed in bed, um, and they needed. Uh, assistance uh, to get uh, a, a, a hundred gallons of oil to them. And so every week we're getting a number of calls where people who are in crisis um, and need fuel. And as you know, um, those 15 days that we experienced with zero or, or less than uh, uh, freezing temperatures is really frightening for people who don't have the money to put oil in their tank. A lot of time they are having to decide between uh, putting food on the table or heating their homes. What is it like when you're finally able to make that delivery to somebody who needs it? Well, you think of your own self and you think of once that oil is in the tank, it feels good. And what, what I know uh, also is that uh, this community is hugely a giving community and uh, uh, we serve some 200 or so individuals and families through this through these funds um, and I suspect that this community will continue to to give and with the incentive of of uh, matching funds from Dead River uh, I, I am absolutely sure we'll meet the 150,000. Excellent. Michael, thank you so much. You can hear it right on cue. The phones are lighting up. Make sure you give us a call or donate on our website. Lee and Lindsay, back to you. All right, Chris, thank you very much. So excited to get up there at 530 answer some phones. Absolutely. All right, is the new Amazon headquarters coming to Maine? Unsurprisingly, <laughs> no. But those 50,000 jobs could be coming to the Northeast. The HQ2 shortlist is coming up. And the weekend is shaping up pretty well. Keith Carson has details on some mild days just ahead. He's literally cleaning up. All right, imagine this. You get in your car, you put the key in, you turn the ignition, and nothing happens, but you just put gas in your car, so what could possibly be wrong? Oh, that would be very puzzling. That <laughs> happened to several customers actually in Waterville this week. As Tennyson Coleman reports, a mix-up at the local gas station led to some very expensive repairs. Some folks in Waterville were in for quite the surprise when they came to fill up at the mobile gas station behind me, and they found out it wasn't gasoline they were putting inside their tanks. I went to uh, start the vehicle, it started, came in the house to get something, came back out, and it shut off, so I restarted it, it shut off again. Kevin Strickland filled up his car last week at the mobile gas pump in Waterville. Strickland and, according to the Kennebec Journal, about a half dozen other drivers unknowingly put diesel into their cars instead of gasoline. The uh, diesel had got mixed into the gas down at the gas station. His engine damaged badly, and it cost him nearly $800. Dan Betts, a technician with Bennett Auto Center in Bangor, breaks down what happens if diesel is put into a gasoline-only vehicle. It creates small beads 
inside the gas tank and it mixes with regular fuel. Sometimes your car will run, but other times it will stall out, smoke, won't run. So in that case, you have to drain your whole fuel system, probably change out your fuel pump. The Kennebec Journal reports that the gas station owner is investigating the incident to determine how the mishap occurred and that they are collecting info so the company can compensate any customers affected. We reached out to the owner, but he was not available to comment. Although it's been a pretty rough week for Strickland, he says he's not too upset. Well, people make mistakes. It's just one of those things, you know. People make mistakes. It's unfortunate. Uh, I feel bad for the person that did it. Hopefully there's going to be no runaround and we can get our, reclaim our money. In Waterville, Tennyson Coleman, New Center, Maine. Now we did reach out to Thompson Volkswagen in Waterville. They didn't want to speak on camera, but a representative for the repair shop says that two vehicles did come in with similar problems. Very interesting. So, yeah, well, Talking about this with Keith Carson. It's an innocent mistake. What are you going to do? It, this happened to me. Bad, but it wasn't I never like put, malicious. I never put diesel in my car, but I wasn't paying attention when I bought my most recent car and went to fill it up and realized it took premium. I was like, oh. I totally, honestly would not have bought the car if it weren't for that. Right, it's just that like extra, extra mentally. The money for it. Do you but. want us yeah. to pass the hat? Is that what you're trying to get to? <laughs> pass the what? Pass the hat. Make a ticket collection for you. Oh yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. No, after you donate for whatever. Yeah. Project Heat. Project Heat. That's yeah, better. he's not dipping into you know Project Heat. You know what's unfortunate about that? In a way, I think we're going to do great tonight because our viewers always step up. Yeah. If we'd done it two weeks ago, though. Oh, during that cold. Two enough. weeks ago, I think people. Yes. It just helps people remember. You know, it, yes. it, being in it because it's it's been relatively decent since then, temperature wise. Uh, here's a look at our snowfall stats so far. It's amazing how far above average we are in Bangor. Look at that, 26 inches above average, eight inches above average in Portland. Everyone though plus side so far for winter, which uh, it kind of feels that way right between the cold and the snow. There's a little lake effect snow. Nothing here though tonight. Temperatures in the 20s at the moment. Most of us got into the 30s. It won't be brutally cold though tonight. We'll be in the teens, a few single digits up towards Presque Isle and Caribou, but most of us will be basically seasonably chilly through the evening. Now tomorrow's not quite as bright. A couple of snow flurries in the morning over the foothills. Otherwise partly cloudy. Temperatures around freezing again. And then we start to warm up on Saturday, but we have to get a warm front through. So a couple of flurries and sprinkles early on Saturday. Warm front moves to the north. We get into temperatures in the mid and upper 40s and a lot of sunshine. I like Saturday afternoon a lot. I wish it were longer, right? If Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock, we'll basically have about uh, three hours left of sunlight, but it will be really nice at that point. Temperatures there on Saturday, consistently mild in the upper 40s, right around 40 degrees in Millinocket. Sunday, though, split state forecast. So 43, 44 in Portland, about 20 in Caribou. So the front will differentiate who gets the warm stuff on Sunday. After that, our next storm system moves in Monday night, starts as snow. At this point, it does look to warm up for a lot of us to rain by Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon. Obviously, we'll keep an eye as that we get a little bit closer on that because it's hard to write off a storm as all rain in the middle of January. It tends to not work out that way usually. But I really like Saturday. I like Sunday as well. As we've talked about, guys, for the Patriots game, no problems at all. Uh, we're going to be probably around 50 degrees at kickoff. Wow. So that should be good for Brady's hand or whatever it is that he did to the his boo-boo. Yeah. His boo -boo. I got, he's got a boo-boo hand. Didn't practice Do you think today. not eating tomatoes probably will heal that? I think that he when also doesn't the media is so bored that when he, Tom Brady misses practice, you right. just like stop the it was world. A so. Right. Firestorm. Yeah. Okay, this just yeah. in. He'll be fine. He'll be there. <laughs> yeah, he'll be all right. Because flat earth stops break, spinning. Breaking news, he'll be fine. Okay, so were you hoping to maybe get a job at the Amazon when it opened up headquarters in Maine and get that employee discount? Yeah. Not going to happen, at least not no. in Maine. No, nope, not happening. Neither of Maine's submissions for the second headquarters made the short list. Brunswick and Scarborough sent proposals into the online retail giant asking CEO Jeff Bezos to open a new headquarters and bring 50,000 jobs to the Pine Tree State. So it was obviously a long shot because of one of Amazon's requirements was a metropolitan area with more than 1 million people. Maine doesn't exactly or at all fit that bill. But the Northeast did get lots of love of the 20 finalists. Boston, New York, Newark, even Toronto made the list where there were definitely a lot of really creative bids that did not make the cut. That includes New Hampshire, which if you remember threw a lot of shade at Boston, saying the apartments are small, the cost of living is expensive, and the traffic is terrible. But it looks like Bezos wasn't swayed. Boston is in, and New Hampshire 
is out. Also rejected, the town that agreed to rename itself as Amazon, Georgia. And that city sent Amazon a giant cactus. <laughs> it's kind of cool. <laughs> to great lengths. There we go. All right, well, right now, many of you are calling in, donating your hard-earned money to help your friends and neighbors who can't afford to heat their homes this winter. Let's check in with the Project Heat Telephone once again. Sam K. Y. in Bangor helping answer those phones. Sammy, it's wonderful to see all of this generosity. Oh, absolutely. Today has been amazing. And honestly, it just it puts it in perspective for you. One, how incredible meters are, and two, how expensive heating oil is. So we've raised over $49,000 so far. These volunteers have been answering the phones all day long. And guess what? They are still ringing. People are still calling to donate their money. So thank you so much to everyone who's called in. You are making a difference to so many Mainers. All that money stays right here in Maine, um, goes to families who may need a little extra help keeping warm this winter. Um, and it's just a great thing to be a part of. It's, it's a great thing to do. And a lot of the people that we've talked to over the phone, they've donated year after year, um, or even sometimes this is the first year that they've done it. And they're just so thankful to be a part of it. So we're going to be here until 730 answering the phones in Bangor and Portland. So give us a call. Every penny counts. Lee and Lindsay, I'll send it back to you. All right, Sam, thank you so much. Cindy Williams here now with a look at what's coming up on New Center at 530. That's right, guys. The police say that they have caught the man who killed an elderly uh, neighbor in Bridgewater. Neighbors of that uh, victim say that the suspect and the victim had a really tumultuous relationship. We've got a live update from the scene of the crime coming up. Also, how much will Central Maine power customers have to shell out to help pay for the windstorm repairs? The numbers that CMP officials are throwing around are pretty staggering. Very interesting. Those numbers coming down this afternoon. Cindy, thanks so much sure for that. Thing. Stay with us more after this. All right, these, viewers have oh, questions. Yeah, I'm sorry. Keith has <laughs> answers. It's a good thing we worked it out. We agreed on the commercial break. Yes, this is actually a viewer question. I love when we get these, so email us. Uh, you can email us now or me, whatever you want to do. Long story short, this guy's a big skier. He basically said, how can we have January thaws, but we don't have the same situation in the summer where it's that much cooler, 20, 30 degrees cooler, as opposed to 20, 30 degrees warmer. All right, let's go to the tape, shall we, which shows us one of the warmest days we had recently, where we're about 50 degrees for a high temperature. This is this is nerd stuff here. Bring it full screen, guys, but 50 degrees, that's what we got to on the 13th. So that is above average, certainly. Our average is in the 20s. But let's go to July. The next screen here will show you a day in July when we only got up to 63 oh. degrees. Do a little math, last full screen for you. Uh, so if you take the average in July and the average in January, and you do some math, they're basically the same. The difference is not everything's melting, it's not dripping, and as a skier, he's not upset about it. it well, it's, but, not visible. it's not a visible change. Right, so. and, and, I, and I think it's just, he, when people are winter enthusiasts, they just forget about what happens in the summer. All right, we have to stop talking apparently. I don't is know the why show Rachel over? keeps talking about it. Is there so. another show New after this? New Center 530 starts <laughs> now. right now. <laughs>